Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Weekly Notice with Andy Ngo. Today is the 1st of September, 2022, and this is episode 23. Please leave your questions and comments throughout the live stream, and I will get to them in um, later on in the show. We have a very packed schedule. I'm excited to be here. I just had a very big investigative report I worked very hard on that was uh, just published on um, Newsweek. I'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, first and foremost, I want to bring your attention to a controversial um, incident, if you will, that happened in Colorado um, last weekend. So um, I've only been in Colorado, I think, once in my life. Um, last year, I spoke at a conference, a conservative conference in uh, Denver. Um, so I don't really know the, uh, I don't know the state well at all. If anybody is um, from there or is familiar with it, please comment and leave questions for me if relevant throughout this particular segment. So um, in Castle Rock, which is in Douglas County, Colorado, there was a Pride event um, called the Pride Fest. Uh, it was put on by a uh, local uh, LGBTQ plus organization called Castle Rock Pride. And I mean, Pride Month was supposed to be June, but June came and went. There was a lot of Pride stuff. Uh, there was a lot of monkey pox infections as a result of that as well. And that's not just my opinion. You can look at um, some of the medical research on where many of the infections have been happening. And the big clusters are, uh, have uh, occurred a lot through festivals. Um so June came and went, July came and went, August came and went, and there were Pride events all throughout these months. So I guess it's a, a Pride summer, you know, let's be charitable, um, Pride summer. And in um, Douglas County, Colorado, there was an event, and um, it, the event was deemed as, well, the whole festival, the Pride Fest was called... Um, family friendly and video emerged uh, a few days ago showing well i'm just gonna play the clip um uh, content warning there's nudity in it but it's sort of there's a drag queen performing and her fake breasts by fake press i mean the um like a prop breast that was part of the uh, cross-dressing costume uh, exposed the nipples. And um, so, yes, content warning, I suppose, for that. Uh, I'm going to play the video. It's not censored. And she's performing in front of this family-friendly event sign. And there are children in the audience. And um, there was an uproar after this video came out from conservatives. I'm going to play it. So this was on August 27. Okay. You can find the video on my um, Twitter, by the way. Wow, titties, tits, tits, there we go. Yeah, so um, the, I, I'm going to pull up the report. I, uh, if you go on my um, Patreon or Locals, um, let's see. 
here we go. My Patreon or locals, you can see a report I wrote. Um, by the way, please subscribe to my locals um, or my Patreon. Uh, the link is in the bio of of if you're watching this on Getter, it's on there. If you if you see this later on YouTube or Twitter or whatever, it's in the bio line. Um, patreon.com slash Andy Ngo is my Patreon, but I, I wrote an article about what happened. Um, so there was quite a, a big uproar and uh, from conservatives. Um, the organize, organizers put out a statement of um, an apology and a clarification of what happened. They said that this was a wardrobe malfunction, that it was an accident. Um the apology didn't really satisfy anybody. And this is the uh, the drag queen that was performing, by the way. The performer's name uh, is Alice Glamour. Um, and this was one of the social media advertiser, advertise, advertisements excuse me, for the event that happened. And that the drag queen on the left is the one that had the uh, wardrobe malfunction. Uh, yeah, so it caused, um, well, one of the city commissioners, who's a conservative, George Teal, put out a statement. Um, he said that the uh, event was a violation of the zoning use of the fairgrounds because the Pride Fest was held on county um, property. Um, so he wrote, I do believe he had a violation of the zoning uses for the fairgrounds this weekend, exotic adult entertainment is not an allowed use at the fairgrounds. So he's trying to work to get um, to ban the organization from being able to host pride events in the future. Uh, so that was a response from the right. The response from the left uh, is that um, they were angry that the organization put on a, uh, the apology. They wrote, this person, and. Uh, Rush Lowe wrote, um, OMG, it was a fake nipple and a fake chest. Really? Is someone actually having an issue with this? At the Denver Pride Fest, there were plenty of real nipples attached to shirtless humans being displayed, and I didn't see Denver issuing some weird apology for that. So yeah, a lot of people on the left thought that there was no issue at all with kids seeing it. Um, this person, Brody um, Vupka wrote, it's not a real nipple, and even if, it, even if it were, why a nipple is a bad thing? It was an accident. Um, yeah. And Ann Foster, this woman who was an attendee at the event, wrote a long statement in response to the apology, saying that she was very upset that there were people there recording the event. Um, well, you know, there were people who came there to monitor and track the event because they've they feel that behind closed doors these family so-called family friendly pride events are um display inappropriate uh content um there's been a lot of drag queen stuff in the news in the past week so we had this in colorado and it's it's part of a wider debate i guess if you will that's been going on about what are the limits of what is appropriate um, content for children in in regards to LGBTQ related pride events? And um, oh, I did an interview on a radio show um, discussing my sharing my thoughts on this, and I'll I'll play that later on a bit. So um, I have some complicated thoughts on it. You know, I'm a I'm a gay man, so I speak from within the community, if you will. Um, I think there are there's a bit of talking past one another on both sides, uh, but I'll get into that in a bit. Um, yes, so drag queens in the news. Well, um, on the twenty eighth of August, which was last Sunday. Um, you may have heard about this incident that happened in Roanoke, Texas, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So there was another family-friendly drag queen event at a um, the Anderson um, Grill. And Roanoke is a, is a small 
said he. Um, and what happened is that uh, there was a militia of Antifa that showed up in Black Block, as you see here in this photograph. And um, they have their ARs out and other weapons visible. And the the point of their presence, um, and they called it a fat, you know, they called the protesters, the conservative protesters, conservative protesters who came to oppose the event, they called them fascists and things like that. So the, the local John Brown gun club, they have a chapter. Um, they allude to me, by the way, and they allude to the Proud Boys and all this stuff and um, saying, I mean, look, these events, parentheses, attacks, on students and family pride events have several times called violence by her people against students, families, and stuff. And by her here, it's referring to the organizer of uh, the conservative protests against that drag queen show, um, Kelly Nida. Uh, I talked about her recently in uh, one of the uh, an essays she wrote about how um, when she was at university, which she graduated this year, that Antifa sought to make her life hell. So. Um, the John Brown Gun Club uh, that put out that statement uh, is for the Elk Fork uh, chapter, and it's run by this guy here uh, named Christopher uh, Guilot. And um, I'm not going to play the sound, but here's... some video from that uh, children's drag show um, where Antifa were armed security for the event. And this is video by Taylor Hansen. I do find it really fascinating that there there wasn't really any progression where drag shows suddenly became like seen as a type of entertainment for kids. Like it just one day it was as it has been for decades, like adult entertainment in the form of drag shows. Um, they're normally I mean, how they're, they're held at, like, gay bars, gay clubs, and um, the content is highly sexualized. It's part of the humor. You know, it's very campy. There's a lot of swearing. There's often nudity, and it's, um, it's, it's a comedy routine for adults. And then just something in the past, what, maybe two two or three years i think it, it really started with the drag queen story times my understanding when that became sort of a, a very common type of event that has been organized in the u.s and multiple other countries then it spread until it more often till let's make our um, by our i mean i was speaking as if i was part of the drag queen community let's make our performances now for children as well and I mean, you've seen some of those videos. The performances are often not even toned down for kids. So they'll invite the kids into the gay bars, as has happened in Texas. So wear um, basically stripper-like clothing. Um, and, you know, they have the children hand them the cash. As And, well, it's not... It's not appropriate. It's not an age-appropriate form of entertainment. And I, I really understand why a lot of people are uncomfortable with that and are angry about it. Um, I talked about this with James Lindsay in, in an interview last week. That was the shortened version. The full version now is on my Ending a Live YouTube, so you can watch that. We discuss this particular topic. But I went on the Grace Curley uh, radio show, and I'm going to play this uh, interview that I did um, discussing 
what happened here in Roanoke, Texas, as well as um, my thoughts on this highly contentious issue in the culture wars currently. Andy No joins us now. Andy, thanks so much for coming on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me on. Andy, before we get into the chaotic scene that played out in Texas, I would love to hear your thoughts on the president saying that Republicans are semi-fascist. Um, that's completely inappropriate. I wasn't aware that he made that statement, although I'm not particularly surprised. I think the Democrats uh, over the past few years have been increasingly mainstreaming the language of Antifa. Um, and even in the best of times, depending on what city you're in, have actually even expressed support for them. So the fact that this is going all the way up is not surprising, although very disappointing. Yeah. So if you guys missed the story out of Texas, and that's what we're going to talk to him about next, it's been all over the news and it's very strange. You hear about these drag shows, and this was heavily armed Antifa militants stand guard outside Texas kid-friendly drag show. A kid-friendly drag brunch for all ages was guarded against protests by armed Antifa militants carrying AR-15s. Uh, the event called the Barrel Babes Drag Brunch was advertised as dancing, music, and laughs. Journalist Taylor Hansen said that the kid-friendly event featured vulgarity and partial nudity. Protesters outside the event were spit on and confronted by activists who support kid-friendly drag brunches. Andy, give us a little bit of information on this event and then how it escalated to the point of needing Antifa militants standing outside. Yes, so to recap, on Sunday, uh, the 28th of August, um, a group of armed and masked Antifa members a mass outside the Anderson Distillery and Grill in the small city of Roanoke, uh, Texas, which is in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, Antifa gathered to intimidate and to counter conservative protesters who uh, had organized to oppose what they said was a drag queen event that exposes children to sexual indecency. And... Did did you notice anything about the interactions that Antifa was having with people outside of this event? Well, the first thing is that the presence of them with armed uh, ARs and also having strategic people placed in nearby buildings as sort of snipers. I mean, the purpose of that is to intimidate those who would dare to express their First Amendment rights. Um, the debate around um, gender ideology and children and particularly very sexualized pride events or drag queen events around children is very contentious and conservatives have expressed their views on the matter and have protested but you see whenever they express their free speech you have people who do things like carry out violence against them such as Antifa have done or show up with guns to threaten that they are ready to kill if need be. I think the takeaway from this, though, is that people who presume that Antifa don't organize in Texas or red states or in the South are incorrect. In fact, they're very organized in some of the most surprising of places, and I think that's because people have generally been complacent and think it's a problem for, let's say, the Boston area or Portland or Seattle or Los Angeles. Yeah, and Andy, I would actually add to that that it's not just that people assume it's not going to happen in their area, but there's a a good portion of people who don't really think it even exists. I mean, you've heard Joy Behar say that before. You've heard politicians say that before, that it's a myth, that it's a fantasy, that Antifa is, you know, just a word used by Republicans. It's a Republican talking point. And I I know you're an editor at the Post Millennial. I I know you're an author and you've written the book Unmasked, but you're also a very brave journalist and you've had your run-ins with Antifa. Antifa, and, and so you can tell my audience firsthand what it's like. Yeah, so when I hear people in media and even politicians say that Antifa doesn't exist as a real organized movement or, or groups, it's infuriating because I'm speaking from my personal experience. I'm somebody who's been repeatedly violently victimized by these groups for daring to document their criminal activities that take place in the public, particularly months of rioting that happened in 2020. I wrote a a New York Times bestselling book on the matter. So 
I guess for those who don't uh, think they're real, I say watch the videos of the assaults on me and look at my hospital records and look at the scars on my body to see what has happened to me for daring to stand up to them. Andy, if you had to say, though, what area um, you've noticed Antifa has the strongest hold of, where would you say? In any area where, any urban area where city council uh, is entirely left wing. So Boston, um, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, Oakland. And I think what the takeaway from that is uh, um, mainstream Democrats have really worked to embolden um, the far left extremists on the side. And in fact, in some ways, Antifa often act as a paramilitary like group of the Democrats, not in the sense of there being an official uh, relationship, but rather Democrat politicians can see that Antifa will use violence to drive away their critics who engage in public First Amendment activities. And then the politicians look the other way. Um, and, I mean, in the case of Portland, the mayor is also the police commissioner, so there's also a conflict of interest there, and this is also repeated in other urban areas. Yeah, but one of the things I'd love to ask you about, you mentioned that these Antifa militants had AR-15s, and that's that's kind of, I noticed that. Because it would seem like for a group of people, they're far left. Uh, we, we hear a lot of these Democrat progressive politicians talking about taking away people's guns. And then you have these people outside of this kid-friendly drag show with AR-15s. I, I can't imagine that the liberal people walking by that like the sight of it. Well, I would agree with you there. But where is the uproar from Democrats over weapon, um on Sunday outside this? Um, drag event. There is no uproar. In fact, they've been completely ignoring it. The liberal press has been ignoring it as well. So all of these liberal and Democrat party linked gun uh, control groups are also revealing that they they're, they aren't actually really about gun control. They're about con- gun control against their political opponents because they really have no issue when people on the far left take up arms to intimidate those who are carrying out free speech activities. And Andy, I do I do find it um, an interesting kind of combination that you have Antifa and, like you mentioned, it's kind of surrounding this gender ideology conversation that's happening in this country. And that, I would argue, is another thing that people on the left like to say, Republicans are blowing that out of proportion. It's, it's not that big a deal. Um, you know, if you don't like it, just walk by it. Do you think gender ideology is something that is going to come to a head where people have to have this conversation? Or do you think we could just keep ignoring it and hoping that, you know, the, the drag, the kid friendly drag shows, you know, don't come to a neighborhood near you? So speaking as someone from within the so-called LGBTQ community, I'm a gay man. I think the the social pact that I think the gay community had with, let's say, wider heterosexual society during all the um, gay marriage debates was that we just want to live as adults in consensual relationships and that um, our lifestyles have nothing to do with children or indoctrination. And in fact, now, what is very distressing is that that pact has been broken by the current manifestation of the LGBTQ lobby movement, because now it is explicitly about indoctrination of children. They are not hiding any of it. And I don't mean indoctrinating them to be homosexual, but sexualizing them from an early age, exposing them to very sexual content in education, sexual content um, in the form of these performances that really have, I mean, you know, it's, it's re- completely reasonable and understandable that parents are, th- th- there's an uproar about this. If you look at any of these shows, which is adult entertainment that normally takes place in the context of a bar or club being performed in a milder way, or sometimes not even milder way in front of children, where they're encouraged to give money to these adult performers, I completely understand why there are those who are calling that a form of grooming or ideological grooming. Andy, no, we appreciate you coming on and all of the work that you do. Can you let people know where they can find you on Twitter and where they can read more of your work? 
Yes, my website is andy-ngo.com, and my Twitter handle is at Mr. Andy NGO. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. We hope to have you on again soon. We'll be right back with your calls, 844-500-4242. This is The Grace Curl. Thanks. Um, I haven't uh, published that interview yet, although we went over the radio, obviously. Um, so, well, those are my thoughts on this uh, debate, if you will. If anybody who's uh, listening or watching is gay or lesbian or bi or trans, uh, I would like to hear your questions and comments. Please leave them in. And anybody else have questions or comments, please uh, drop them in. I'll get to them later on on the show. I also wanted to remind people to please um, support me if you can on my Patreon or locals. You can also give me a, a, a tip on um, through my PayPal, my uh, Venmo, and Cash App. Uh, this live stream uh, from day one has been entirely ad free, um, and that's intentional. I don't like that. Um, you know, for programming when it's interrupted by, you know, the host trying to sell something. It just, it takes time away from the content. I'd rather be talking about the news. Okay. Um, back to Portland. When is Portland not in the news? Um, well, I, I always talk about it because one, um, I lived uh, there during the worst of times. And it's a city that uh, where I've been um, really brutally, violently victimized by Antifa. And it's a city that's um, dealing with uh, record homicides and just lawlessness that's still continuing after the riots of 2020. So um, I did a report for the post millennial um, Portland street mob shoots that elderly driver accidentally kills one of their own. Um, and there were several intersections in the city that were taken over simultaneously by um, these sideshow car occupations. You've probably seen similar videos in other um, American cities where you have hundreds of people uh, and all these cars just take over a street and they do um, stunts. They uh, burn rubber, they do drifting, they do the donut circles. And it's just a sort of a form of, um, it's, I guess, an activity that they find entertaining. But, you know, you shut down the roads illegally. It's dangerous. People have been hit by the cars when they're doing these stunts. And, well, it happened in Portland uh, over the weekend, and some of the some of the video that's come out is 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 really shocking, um, and and really disturbing. So, in North Portland, um, there was a an elderly man uh, in the picture on the right here. He's driving a white van. He got caught in the middle of it all because, well, it's on. Um, it was like next to a highway. So there are people who drive by and he just got caught up in the middle of it. He tried escaping and they, they brutally attack his vehicle, which caused him to panic. And he attempts to drive off and then they start shooting up the vehicle. And um, yeah, I'm just going to play it. Let's see, so that's, um, I'm going to pull up my Twitter actually. Here you go. So this was on uh, August 28th near the Expo Center in North Portland. And here's the driver.
Yeah, so he's like bleeding out of his mouth and um, the I counted 18 rounds that were fired from a pistol at the vehicle. So three people were shot in that incident that happened there that you see. One of them appears to be the um, the elderly man uh, and uh, the the press release that the police put out so that he um, had a non-life, non-life-threatening injury. Um, another uh, was shot, but the per- other two people that were shot were people from on the side of the, occup- uh, the people who occupied that intersection. Uh, and the third person who was shot was shot and killed. Um, so... Here's a um, an Antifa weighed in on it because it was somebody sort of adjacent to their community. It wasn't somebody who was part of the Antifa movement per se, but was friends with a family member of one of them. So um, they Antifa participated and promoted a vigil on the GoFundMe campaign for the young man's um, funeral. Um, his name is Cameron Taylor. Uh, he's only 20 years old. Um, so here's a tweet from an Antifa account. Um, burn it down, 161. 161 um, stands for, it's a numeric ren- rendering of AFA, which is a anti-fascist um, action. That's one of the names of the Antifa organization. Um, my boy's lifelong friend was killed last night at the street takeover. There's a candlelight vigil tonight at 8. Please help get the word out and please help get candles donated. Uh, no BS, please respect the family. And well, it's a, you know, this account it makes all this allusions to violence and fire, burning down things. Um, and yeah, they, you know, did some vandalism in the name of this young man who got killed. Um, yeah, so they try to kill the elderly man, uh, ended up killing somebody on their own side. That's, and by the way, police made no arrests in this particular incident. Um, police said that they didn't have the resources to respond. So tough. If you live by there, if you're caught up in that, call 911. It's too bad. It's basically the reality situation. So in addition to that takeover, There was another one in Portland that same night uh, that really stretched police resources. Um, And here they used a flamethrower on the street. I'm just going to play the video. Yes, that is Portland. And keeping on the subject of Portland, um, I had a big report that was just published um, just a bit before this live stream went out um, on on Newsweek. Um, a preschool teacher's disturbing social media gets him barred from job. Um, So my report is about this man here, Marco Antonio Reyes Rojas. He is a preschool teacher in Portland who um, last month got a lot of media attention locally and also even in the D.C. area, actually, uh, for coming out about having contracted monkeypox. He's an openly gay man. He's gotten media attention before in the past in Oregon because he's an... uh, was an activist advocating on for the rights of rights and privileges of um, illegal aliens living in the U.S. illegally. Um, but a lot of people felt he was very brave to come out about having monkeypox and being unable to uh, be at the school to be the preschool teacher. And it was also to promote his GoFundMe. So um, thousands of dollars were poured in. Um, people who 
wanted to help out this uh, upright citizen, right? Um, I did a very long and deep investigation and um, I'm going to give a content warning with some of the pictures I'm going to show. Well, um, I found out that Marco runs two Twitter accounts. So he has a public facing account where his uh, name and face is on it. But he also has a, another Twitter account where he posts porn that he makes and other sexually explicit material. Um, that in itself, it, it, but it goes beyond that. Um, the report is particularly about how um, for more than a year now, he has posted constantly about being sexually aroused and being so uncontrollably horny at, uh, at his work and being high or being drunk. And this is a preschool teacher. So um, I'm going to show you some of the uh, screenshots, by the way. So um, this was that secret tw Twitter account. I'm just going to read from it uh, at Central Bottom. Um, 30-year-old Mexican oral power bottom living in Portland, Oregon, preschool teacher by day and central bottom by night, 18 plus. Um, so, you know, and this is some of the, this is one of the headlines. This is uh, people uh, uh, in Espanol. This is a translated headline. The Hispanic teacher from Oregon is infected with monkey pox and makes an urgent appeal to the community. He raised a lot of money, um, but... These are the type of posts that are on this account. Um, f uh, there's a typo here. Uh, first time masturbating at work. It felt so good. I don't know why I haven't done this yet. This was written in June of last year, and there's a devil emoji. Um, there's this one from uh, earlier this year. I swear I'm still high right now at work and horny. And these are these different emoji faces. Um, and there's more and it goes on and on. Um, this is a, a photograph of him, by the way. His GoFundMe, by the way, was um, there was an employee of GoFundMe, according to him, Carla Flores, and she helped connect him to the press. So... You know, we've seen over and over GoFundMe promote causes that are actually very, ultimately quite damaging to society, like they did with various BLM and Antifa campaigns in 2020. Um, so here he wrote at the end of last year, hungover, horny, and at work. Um, and this was recent on the 18th of July this year. He wrote, fantasizing all the... Um, uh, it's an, <laughs> all the blank I've sucked last night at work and there's drooling emoji so and look at this one uh, also from July this year I had many firsts this month of July I fisted a person for the first time just hooked up with the 66 year old and got effed at a bathhouse um, July has been wild so far and they, you know, he posted these pictures of his genitals and backside that um, are censored, that I censored <laughs> in the original there, um, all there. So, uh, and this is a screen, um, yeah, this is a picture of him with some of the pustules that he developed from monkeypox. He said he didn't know he, how he got it, um, but he, if you look at, like, he was basically doing kind of a count down a reverse countdown like a day five was monkeypox day 10 day 12 whatever if you count back to like day zero and you looked on the social media account he posted about being in a gay bathhouse in portland um so what's particularly significant about this report is that it has um well actually i'm gonna pull up something at least you can see Uh, oh, I 
thought I had it. Um, what's significant about this report is that, well, I reached out to the state um, Oregon um, Department of Education for comment. Um, and they have like an early childhood education sub department within the agency. And um, they did their own investigation about what I was asking them about this particular person. I wanted to know when, um, when did he get his credentials with the state? Can you confirm his employment? He, um, and Marco worked at a, um, a place called the Fruit and Flower Child Care Center in Portland. I tried, I had a call multiple times. The first time the person answered and then hung up. And then I called back and spoke with the person who said she was the, direct, the director of the center, but refused to give her name and refused to uh, say comment at all about if Marco uh, is an employee there. Um, he was by the way, and I found that, that out through the records that the state has. So um, they were being completely obstructing um, in my investigation. And um, anyways, so the state agency, by the way, after I reached out for comment from them, they issued um, an emergency order suspension against uh, Marco Reyes Rojas. Um, and um, this is a, a document that's within um, the public record now, so you can find the original. But if you go on my Twitter, I put screenshots. So they have suspended him from um, the, uh, the registry that's required if you're working with um, children in any capacity. And um, this is what they wrote. Um, this is OCC, is the Office of Child care. OCC has determined that individual has demonstrated behavior that poses a substantial threat to the health and safety of child care children in that an immediate suspension from the central background registry is necessary to protect children from harm. OAR 414, it lists out um, some of the state statutes. Further, OCC has determined that individual poses a serious danger to child care children and that immediate suspension is necessary. It says its name. Um, the suspension says he can request a, um, a hearing um, within 90 days, uh, but this has gone into immediate effect. Um, I reach out to Marco for comment, by the way. Um, that was pretty hard tried lots of different places. Um, he declined to comment, by the way. He said he had no interest in speaking with me about um, the subject. So please uh, read the investigation. On Newsweek, a preschool teacher's disturbing social media gets him barred from job. There's more disturbing stuff. Um, I'm going to show you one last thing before I move on about this report. So he did a whole bunch of interviews to promote his GoFundMe. And you can see he's in uh, a room in his home, the living room. And there's a particular album uh, artwork on the wall from different pop singers, Lana Del Rey, Rihanna. And that same room is where he did a lot of his porn videos, by the way. You can see here. Okay. And well, whenever I talk about Portland, there's always bad news or sad news. Um, this is a, a city in the middle of historic levels of deadly violence. And um, this case has been that uh, this next story is just it's shocking, but it's not shocking. Um, so um, the head, this is from the Oregonian. Uh, Portland Freedom Fund bailed out man accused of violating domestic violence order. A week later, he was charged with murder. So 
Um, the Portland Freedom Fund, Fund is an Antifa-linked group in Portland that raises a hell of a lot of money to bail out um, violent criminal suspects. Um, they say that their goal is to bail out Black and Brown and Indigenous people. Um, it's from a group that doesn't that thinks the criminal justice system is not legitimate. Um, and that the incarcerations shouldn't ha be happening at all. And the person they helped out now um, allegedly murdered somebody days after they paid thousands to bail him out. So it's a, a man named Mohammed uh, Osman Aden. Um, he had, um, there was a protective order that was granted against him by uh, an ex of his, the mother of his children. And he was recently arrested because he uh, showed up to where she was. And he has um, GPS monitoring, by the way. Um, and uh, he uh, cut off a GPS monitor and um, went to the woman's town uh, home. And um, after he was arrested, the Portland Freedom Fund, which is run by one woman named uh, Amanda Trujillo, and um, after he was bailed out days later, he's accused of murdering the, the woman that he that that had a successful protective order against him. Um, her name is uh, Rachel Angel Abraham. Um, she was strangled to death and police found her dead body with really huge gashes, cuts, and there was a knife at the scene. Um, the Portland Freedom Fund released a statement, um, saying that, uh, they bailed him out because he was in communication with them and that he's a father and it wasn't an apology or anything. It was basically just saying that they, um, they're not at fault that he went on to allegedly murder. Um, I'm gonna... so this group, by the way, is quite indiscriminate in who they bail out. So you have somebody who's now allegedly went on to kill, but the the Antifa link with them is the fact that they they're the ones that paid the down payment on the uh, two point one million dollar uh, bail for Malik Muhammad uh, last year. He was um, a BLM rioter from Indianapolis who went to Portland. He was um, eventually convicted earlier this year and sentenced to ten years in jail, the in ten years in prison uh, for. Uh, manufacturing explosives, using them in intent to kill police at a, at a Portland riot. Um, so the Portland Freedom Fund bailed him out. Um, he was rearrested on federal charges and was held until he had his trial. Um, but this is, you know, and nobody batted an eye when this group did this. But what it demonstrated to me last year is that it, to them, it's kind of like the worse the crime, the better, you know. Um, this man, uh, Malik Muhammad here, he, if you read the criminal complaints, um, there's um, the prosecutors um, found evidence that he had had tactical training in Louisville. So he was crossing over from like state to state to state in 2020 during the riots to build up to this moment in Portland where he tried to um, attempt uh, mass murder with these homemade explosive devices. Um, here's the video again of, uh, here's the video of him throwing it. So Book got on fire. He was, you know, mere inches away from it landing in the middle of a group of Portland police officers. And it's the Portland Freedom Fund who helped him. Uh, just as they helped this man who, um, Mohammed Osman Adan, who allegedly brutally strangled a young mother 
to death. Whew. Okay. Um, I'm going to get to the questions and comments now. Please leave them. Uh, continue leaving them for me, by the way. It's uh, okay. So my four sons wrote, I question why these children's parents think it's appropriate to expose their children to this. And this is in reference to the various so-called family-friendly drag shows. Um, I think a lot of liberal, if you, if you watch the, there are two things going on. If you watch the videos of where these children drag show events are happening, where, where there are children in the audience, the adults that are with them are their mothers. It's, women, straight women who are taking their children here. Um, I think that observation, what that points to is, well, you know, drag performances are have been, in addition to being very popular, obviously with gay men, you know, because they're happening in gay areas, they are popular with straight women. So there's, you know, these women ha want to see these shows, but then they're taking their kids to it. And I think the other angle to it uh, is that, you know, if they're leftists or the liberal, they think that they are making, that they're exposing their children to um, LGBTQ community and making them more tolerant. The thing is, as I as I said in the uh, radio interview I played earlier, the these type of drag show performances are are not um, age appropriate for children and it doesn't really matter if you're shifting the context from a, a bar or club to you know some breakfast place um the nature of the shows themselves the culture within it is that is it's sexual comedy that's what it is and that's by the way it's not to say that all cross-dressing is inappropriate as a performance for children you know obviously if you go back I mean, for the last hundred years, you can watch even in children's programming early on, cross-dressing was used as a form of humor, right? Or you can, you know, remember Bugs Bunny cross-dressing as a female looking bunny is humor. And there's an element of that that I can understand that is um, uh, completely age appropriate and funny. If you If you're British, they have a tradition around Christmas of these um, shows where, uh, these uh, theater shows where um, there's cross-dressing happening in it. And it's completely non-sexual though. It's it's done for comedic effect. But that's not what these type of um, pride sh events stuff, that's not the purpose of the, the, the cross-dressing. It's not meant to be, look, we're dressed in a ridiculous way it's funny, it's a joke, let's laugh together. It's about men dressing to look like a character of a woman and then performing in a provocative sexual way, kind of like a sort of, you know, uh, uh, like a striptease type of thing. And um, yeah, so, okay, uh, continuing. Uh, my four sons also asked, where were the local police in Texas during the drag event? Well, from my understanding, they were standing outside. Um, and, you know, it's not the drag show for kids themselves are not illegal. Nobody has been able to demonstrate that the fact that they're happening, that there's some type of crime. Um, these are considered First Amendment type of things. Um and, you know, in Texas, you can very easily open carry your, your weapons. So the anti militia there um, are not breaking any laws by doing what they're doing. And they know that. Um, but the point of having Antifa there with their guns is to intimidate um, any conservative groups or people who would dare to protest these events. 
Okay. Uh, John Morton asked, do the homeowners in Portland not care? And this is a reference to the those car takeovers on the street and record surge and homicides and shootings. Um, of course, homeowners in Portland care. Um, but I think the problem is they haven't been able to connect that uh, the issues that we see in Portland right now is a direct result of how the people there vote and also a direct result of the political culture that they are often a part of. Um, I think if you, probably if you interview like the average Portlander in Port, um, about the 2020 riots, you ask them who was involved in that, I don't think they would really know. They would say some type of variation of, police are brutalizing racial justice protesters, police are brutalizing BLM, um, that those who are setting fires to the buildings, who are trying to siege the courthouse, these are outside agitators, maybe they were right wing. Like, that's actually quite a common sentiment. And it's, um, those misconceptions are out there because the local reporting uh, has been really poor, had has and had been really poor in any type of coverage on far left extremism. Um, so, and, and the homeowners haven't really connected that the, the left wing people who served on served past tense as well as present tense on city council have created um, a pervasive environment for left wing political violence. So I think, I don't know what it will take for people to connect to it because you know, those Portlanders obviously are not going to read my reporting, unfortunately, and the places that they do tune into in the papers they read are not going to report accurately about what's what has happened and is continuing to happen. Okay. Uh, so Porky Logan, in response to the the video of the of the street takeover people firing at least eighteen rounds at the elderly driver trying to flee, he wrote, um, "Wow, not enough resources to investigate a shooting that's on video." Uh, well, that it's not that they don't have enough resources resources to investigate the shooting after the matter. It's that they didn't have what they say they didn't have enough people to respond when this street takeover happened. You know, these street takeovers last for a few hours at a time. It's not like it's just like, a you know, comes and goes in a spot. Like police obviously had time to respond. Um, but yeah, Portland is dealing with historic low uh, numbers as a result of the violence in 2020. A lot quit, a lot took early retirement. Um, and a lot transferred to other departments because it's so difficult to work in Portland. It's a really horrible environment to be if you're in law enforcement because you don't you don't have the support of the city leadership or the state leadership, and you're demonized also by the people who live there. So um, Portlanders are experiencing essentially what they're asking for, and it, obviously there's a minority of people who have been against this from the beginning, but they're, they have to suffer with it in the same way or, or worse. You know, I would put myself um, in that camp. I'm somebody who's been vocal for years now about horrible political leadership that enabled and emboldened the most extreme and violent thug elements within the city. And now you have, at times, literal anarchy and chaos and deadly violence that just happens like in the middle of the city and um it keeps happening over and over i don't know if you remember but back in 2017 there was an elderly driver in downtown during a, a blm street protest that was an illegal protest police didn't respond this driver got um attacked by this mob and that was like a precursor things have gotten so much worse since then <sighs> Okay. Um, well, everyone, um, I just want to remind you that my um, I'm able to do this live stream and continue my reporting um, because of your support. 
And so please, um, this is my, my link tree page, but if you go on my, um, my locals and no go zone, uh, <laughs> no dot NGO, sorry, NGO dot locals.com. You can join and support me. Um, I have a, uh, Patreon as well, uh, patreon.com slash Andy Ngo. Um, please, uh, support me where you can because, um, yeah, journalism, uh, there's not big money in journalism, you know, it's a different thing if you're, you're working for like the New York Times or the Washington Post or something, but when you're writing about the things that I do that are an inconvenience to the mainstream left, well, you know, you have to go independent. So please support me where you can. And I really appreciate everyone who um, made time to join this week and sending me uh, questions and comments. Um, and I, I look forward to seeing you next week, okay, at 7 p.m. Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.